Good evening, I'm Keisha Betts with the CTV News Update. Maryland's highest court overturns a controversial Prince George's redistricting map. Supporters of the court's decision celebrated last night in Riverdale. The months long battle was brought about by two plaintiffs after six council members made a last minute change to the map, despite objections from residents. Although the council majority was accused of gerrymandering, the case was won on procedural grounds. Eric Olson, who is running for his old district three seat once again, was elated with the outcome. Courts found that the the council acted improperly and um, you know now we are you know we are where we should have been back in October and November. Uh, the, the district lines are now fair, they're impartial, they were they were drawn by the the nonpartisan apolitical redistricting committee and they keep communities together and they don't have you know these odd shaped protrusions that, that cut people out of their districts. Council Chair Calvin Hawkins released a statement in response to the Court of Appeals ruling. He says the body will comply with the decision. Hawkins added that the reason the council appealed the lower court ruling was because of the ballot question approved by Prince George's voters in 2012. That question authorized the council to take action on redistricting plan by resolution. Once notice was given and a public hearing was held. Meantime, you may recall this scene in College Park last October. Protesters gathered outside City Hall to demonstrate against the redistricting map that was introduced at the 11th hour by Derek Davis. One of those in attendance was Lon Subata of the West Lanham Hills Citizens Association. I remember being at one of the first meetings and watching it on, online and the first time they voted it through. Um, then they had to do it again because they realized they did it wrong. And then so I think everybody kind of knew oh, they didn't really know what what they were doing. So we were hoping that there would be a way to get them on on uh, on making sure that this wasn't, you know, that it wasn't done correctly. Um, uh, you know, whatever way we were able to be heard is the way we needed to be heard. And if it was to get them on a whatever they might say as a technicality or, or whatever, it, it obviously uh, was one that they themselves had not fully prepared for. Meantime, President Biden announces a new ban on Russian oil imports in an effort to cripple Russia for its invasion of Ukraine. The ban means Russian oil, gas and coal will no longer be accepted at U.S. ports. Biden says Americans will unfortunately feel the impact of the ban with higher gas prices. Since Putin began his military buildup on Ukrainian borders, just since then, the price of the gas at the pump in America went up 75 cents. And with this action, it's going to go up further. I'm going to do everything I can to minimize Putin's price hike here at home. In coordination with our partners, we've already announced that we're releasing 60 million barrels of oil from our joint oil reserves. Biden has warned energy companies not to price gouge customers at the pump. Congress passes a groundbreaking bill that will make lynching a federal hate crime. The Senate unanimously passed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act of 2022 last night. The measure was named after 14-year-old Emmett Till, who was lynched in Mississippi back in 1955. Offenders could receive a maximum sentence of 30 years in prison. The bill passed the House last week, drawing this response from Maryland Democrat Steny Hoyer. For generations, African Americans and other minorities were terrorized by lynchings, and their memory and symbolism are still used today to intimidate and frighten. That's what these were about, to terrorize others so that they would not seek redress of grievances. You know, that's in the Constitution. But this was intimidation. Lynching means the premeditated extrajudicial killing by a mob or group of people in order to instill fear. That's its definition if you go to the dictionary. Today we'll send a strong message that such actions have no place in the United States of America. The bill is now awaiting President Biden's signature. Prince George's police need your help locating a missing man. This is 24-year-old Quentin Irby. He was last seen at the 4700 block of Hamilton Street early Monday morning. Irby is about 5 feet 8 inches tall and weighs about 145 pounds. He was last seen wearing jeans, a black jacket, and black sneakers. Anyone with information on his whereabouts is asked to contact police. 
Here are the latest COVID-19 numbers for our area. Of the 294 newly confirmed cases, 34 are in Prince George's. The county's positivity rate is up slightly to 1.43 percent. 18 Marylanders have died of the disease since, since the last numbers were released. 286 people remain hospitalized. You're watching CTV News. I'm Keisha Betts. We'll be back in a moment. A free three-minute online chat can give us the personalized tips we need. Visit AsiaRetirement.org. Welcome back. Here's the latest on that Silver Spring apartment explosion that sent 14 people to the hospital. Montgomery County Fire Chief Skeet Scott Goldstein says the incident at Friendly Garden Apartments was an accident. He says a building maintenance worker was working on a clogged drain when he inadvertently cut a gas line. Meantime, Goldstein says 12 people have been discharged from the hospital, but one person remains in critical condition. It's International Women's Day to observe the occasion. CTV is featuring a woman who has been working in media for a decade. Her name is Karen McConnell Jones. McConnell Jones is the CEO of Vision and Purpose Media Productions located in Largo. Focusing on what she calls hidden gems, her production company features documentaries, cooking and financial literacy shows. McConnell Jones is also publishing a magazine called V&P Community Magazine. She says celebrating 10 years feels great. The community is basically the reason why I am here and being able to say I'm here for 10 years, you know. So our tagline is, and what we like to say, community is where community is everywhere. So we just don't report the story here in Prince George's County. We support the stories all over. So, um, yeah, we just want to inspire community everywhere. McConnell Jones is hosting a 10 year celebration this Friday starting at 630 p.m. And still ahead on CTV News tonight, we continue our conversation with legendary journalist Bruce Johnson. Stay with us. Thank you for staying with us. A bill that would require certain information for crimes of violence be publicly posted on data dashboard passes unanimously out of the Maryland Senate. The legislation requested by Governor Hogan originally required a report on sentencing decisions by individual judges, including details outside of the state's sentencing guidelines. A bill was amended to remove its emergency status and combined sentencing data by county or circuit so that individual judges aren't signaled out. Senate Bill 392, the President, State Commission on Criminal Sentencing Policy, Annual Report and Data Dashboard, the Judicial Transparency Act of 2022. All right, Senate Bill 392 is on third reader for final passage. Any discussion? If not, the clerk will call the roll. Mr. President. Has everyone recorded their vote? Anyone wish to change their vote? Explain their vote. If not, the clerk will take the call. With 46 votes in the affirmative, Senate Bill 392 having received a constitutional majority is declared passed. Hogan has introduced similar versions of the bill since 2019. The measure has now moved to the House. The clock is ticking to complete those dreaded taxes. If you have kids and have not started your returns yet, listen up. IRS spokesperson David Tucker says if you received advanced child tax credit payments, you actually only received half of it. Tucker says when filing your tax returns, you need to claim the second half of this tax credit. Tucker also says there's some good news for you if you had a baby last year. So if they had a child born in 2021, then they are potentially eligible for claiming that child tax credit. So we really encourage them to, even if they don't have a requirement to file, to go ahead and file a 2021 tax return and potentially claim that child tax credit, which they would be eligible for with that newborn child. We will have more with Tucker about the 2021 tax season tomorrow. Tonight, we continue our interview with the legendary newscaster Bruce Johnson. Johnson retired after 44 years in front of the TV cameras and penned a book about his life. Byron Scott sat down with Johnson and has our story. And we're back with Bruce Johnson. The book is called Surviving Deep Waters. It's about his life. And Mr. Johnson back once again today joining us. Thank you once again. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you calling me Mr. Johnson. Because you owe me money. Only people that I owe money to <laughs> call me Mr. <laughs> talk about, you said there are bombshells in this book. Talk, talk about that a little bit and what you hope the lessons are from that. Okay. Uh, in, the, in the title, uh, we, we, we talk about uh, my mother's deepest secret. Okay. Uh, I, I'll tell you, uh, that secret is that the, the guy that I grew up thinking was my natural father 
turned out not to be my natural mm -hmm. father. My mother knew this all along, and uh, she hid me within her family. Uh, she told me while I, I was a reporter here in Washington, she came to visit, uh, and uh, he was already dead. So my natural father didn't know about me, and I certainly didn't know about him. Guy I thought was my natural father never lived with us. He had abandoned us. So I, I'm thinking I'm fatherless mm -hmm. for the most part. So I, I did what a reporter does uh, after she told me. I pursued that story, and I now know who he was. I know a lot about him, and I met my siblings of that side of the family. It's, it's all laid out there. What was that like for you? Uh, them. Well, for half a day, because she told me right before I went into work, for half a day I was very upset about it. I, I wanted to punish her. I mean, mm -hmm. I, how could you? Uh, you know, all, all these things I've done without because I didn't have a father and I'm seeing these other kids who had fathers and I know how it impacted them in a positive way and I knew what I was missing, at least I thought I did, not having a father. So that didn't last longer than oh, half a day. My friend and co uh, anchor, Gordon Peterson, he felt more pity for her than mm -hmm. for me. He talked about her courage, I mean, you know, to keep me in the family and not take some measures, you, you know, that wouldn't have me sitting here talking mm -hmm. to you now. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, I, I just admired her courage. I admired, you know, the more I learned about the story of all that she had been through. I, ha I, I sit here and I talk to you. I have no resentments toward anything, toward anybody. Uh, because she paid my fare, she and my grandmother, they paid my fare uh, and, and allowed me to, to not only succeed, but in some instances to thrive. You talk about in the book about covering news in the D.C. area, and you mentioned in particular Marion tough covering him. Why, why is that? It, it, well, it, it was tough, but a good kind of tough. It was okay. exciting. I mean, Marion Barry was the story. Uh, you know, we're sitting here in Prince George's County. A lot of people that, that, that live here in Prince George's County are doing quite well. It's because of Marion Barry. Uh, when he came into government, he says in his own book that he had to integrate every uh, uh, agency of city government because blacks couldn't go work in these places. And we're not just talking about the entry level jobs. We're not just talking about the middle management jobs. We're talking about cabinet level, people who are qualified, mm -hmm. people who had done the work and gotten the degrees and the experience. So. It was exciting to cover Marion Barry. I mean, there were times we had very good friends. Our sons went to preschool together. He'd been to my house, I'd been to his house. And of course then, when all the controversy sets up, you know, now it's all hands on deck, everybody's backed into their corners, media's over here, I'm a part of that, Marion's over here, he's running from us, and we're chasing him, uh, you know, notwithstanding all those good things I just said. But here's the thing that I, I always tell people about Marion Barry. I'm the only journalist that he wanted to speak at his funeral. Mm -hmm. I'm the only guy journalist who spoke at his funeral. That tells you what my relationship with Marion Barry is about. Because I'm going to tell you the whole story, not just the sensational part, not just, you know, the, mm -hmm. the guy was huge. There, there hasn't been another political figure as big and probably will never be in D.C. Okay, so once again, as, as you can tell, our time is up for now. Uh, Surviving Deep Waters is the book by Bruce Johnson, and I think you'd like to get this, people to buy this book. <laughs> it's Correct? A, it's a good book. Yeah. All right, well, thank I'd you. I'd buy it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Surviving Deep Waters is available on Amazon, Politics and Prose, and other bookstores in the area. Climate change will be the focus of two back-to-back -back gubernatorial forums this week. The first is tonight from 7 to 8.30 at the University of Maryland College Park. The event at the Riggs Alumni Center will be in person as well as live streamed, although in-person tickets are sold out. The second takes place Wednesday at the same time at Goucher College in Towson. For more information, go to the Maryland League of Conservation Voters website at mdlcv.org and then search for upcoming events. Well, let's get a quick check on our three-day weather forecast tonight. Cloudy with a chance of rain with a low around 37. Wednesday, mostly cloudy with a low around 39. Thursday, partly sunny with a high near 51. Friday, mostly sunny with a high near 59. And now for the community calendar. County officials are urging residents to get their vaccinations and boosters. Two vaccination clinics will be held for residents to receive their first dose or booster. The free events take place March 12th and April 16th from 11 a.m. until 3 p.m. at 7187 Old Alexandria Ferry Road in Clinton. Bring your ID and vaccination card for booster shot information. And that wraps up our CTV News Update. I'm Keisha Butts. Have a good night.